Okay, welcome to week 24 Humanities Slideshow. Don't forget to turn in your week 23 HLAs by photo to your academic team. We're going to begin today with memory work. Uh, we'll start with a character trait and uh, you will say it out loud with me. I will start it by saying ready, begin. Ready, begin. Sensitivity is using my senses to perceive the true attitudes and emotions of others. I listen to others fully. I watch facial expressions. I notice tone of voice. I put myself in others' shoes. I show that I care. This is the introduction to the Human Body Song. It's new for some of most of our classes. We're going to be working on it through the end of the school year and uh, you'll have many weeks to work on it. You can go to your Google Drive and look up Intro to the Human Body and the song will come up and it has three verses and you can see them here. If you want to sing along, go ahead and pause and go ahead and do that. These are our math cheers. Ready, begin. People like to learn to like math and I'm on that positive path. Mathematical thinking is if then thinking and helps me in everyday life. Visualizing math helps me see the way each problem is supposed to be. Checking my work again is better for my brain. Six reasons people miss math problems. Visualizing, ready, begin visualizing so i imagine the math messiness so i write neatly reading so i carefully read the whole problem simple math so i watch for my mistakes transferring so i double check what i write concepts and then i read it again or ask for help timeline dates and events ready begin prehistory First evidence of human migration from Africa to Eurasia. Stone Age. Figures painted in Lascaux, France caves. 10,000 BCE. Mesopotamians developed agriculture in Fertile Crescent. 8,000 BCE. South Americans developed cave painting, textiles, and agriculture in Peru. 3,200 BCE. Sumerians invented cuneiform writing. 3,000 BCE. Pharaoh Menes unified Upper and Lower Kingdoms of Egypt. 1700 BCE, Hammurabi compiled first known law code in Babylon. 1339 BCE, King Tutankhamun entombed in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. 1300 BCE, epic story of Gilgamesh recorded early Mesopotamian culture. 1250 BCE, Greeks fought Trojan War in Anatolia. 1122 BCE, Zhou Dynasty invoked Mandate of Heaven, beginning longest rule of China. 1050 BCE, Phoenicians devised phonetic alphabet. 776 BCE, Greeks held first recorded Olympic Games. 753 BCE, legendary twins Romulus and Remus founded Rome. 587 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and destroyed its temple. 563 BCE, Prince Siddhartha, later known as Buddha, born in India. 539 BCE, Babylon fell to Persian King Cyrus the Great. 522 BCE, Chinese philosopher Confucius initiated teaching of ethics. 509 BCE, Roman Republic replaced monarchy. 508 BCE, Athenians instituted first democracy. 500 BCE, Greek mathematician Pythagoras proposed round earth theory. 480 BCE, classical period began influenced by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 330 BCE, Alexander the Great's conquests spread Greek culture into Egypt and Asia. 221 BCE, Qin Dynasty began constructing Great Wall along China's northern border. 44 BCE, Julius Caesar assassinated in Rome on the Ides of March. 27 BCE, Octavian installed as first Roman emperor. 3 BCE, Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, Judea. 
79 CE, Mount Vesuvius erupted, destroying Pompeii. 476 CE, Western Roman Empire collapsed. This is our new poem for this month, starting week 24. We're going to uh, begin it uh, with Mark Antony's funeral oration. And we're going to read the whole title when I say ready, begin. Ready, begin. Mark Antony's funeral oration from the play Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper call, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? And yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. We'll be talking more about that poem um, in, our, in the next sections. This is our Western Europe song. This song can be found in your Google Drive, and you can just search for Western Europe. And I will use my laser pointer to locate the countries as we sing today. Ready, begin. Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, and Netherlands, France and Monaco, Germany are all in Western Europe. And you can locate those countries as you sing along also. The Roman Empire is uh, going to soon grow and take over Western Europe. And all of our next year is going to be spent studying um, more about what happened in Europe. And so that is why we're singing the Western Europe song, helping us understand what, uh, you know, Rome ended up, Ro the Roman Empire ended up uh, conquering and also preparing for next year. Welcome to week 24 character. Sensitivity is, ready, begin. Sensitivity is using my senses to perceive the true attitudes and emotions of others. I listen to others fully. I watch facial expressions. I notice tone of voice. I put myself in others' shoes. I show that I care. Now, to be sensitive, you're going to have to use your senses. And we have five of them. You have hearing, smelling, seeing, touching, and tasting. So uh, you can pause and pause the movie and go through these six images and maybe discuss what senses would be used in each of these photos. Um, yeah. On this one, I have some pictures that I'm going to start discussing uh, to find out what which ones of the I wills are being shown. In, in these pictures. So you have this mother and daughter or, or uh, talking, and then you have this picture. You can pause it and discuss who is showing and how are they showing sensitivity in each of these photos.
Welcome to week 24 Geography and Quiz. This is our new song, the Northern Africa song. I'm sorry, this is our old song we were using, um, and it's it. if we were in school together, this would be a test we would be taking on week 24. Um, and I can show you a, a little bit of review, and then the next slide is a chance for you to take your own fake quiz at home just to make sure you know the names of the countries. The younger grades don't usually have to find out where the locations are, but you're welcome to try. It's definitely something that some people will choose to do. Um, so I'll start singing it. Ready, begin. Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Canary Islands, and Western Sahara. So now on the next slide, you can go ahead and do the same thing. Pause and use the back of a pencil eraser or something like that to uh, touch a touch screen and you can walk through and quiz yourself. Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Canary Islands, and Western Sahara. Also, I, this is my chance to talk to you about the Five Great Circles map and how much we love that here at ACE. This is one of the trademark assignments at ACE. We use it for almost every grade in the school, and you continue to get better and better at it. So you are going to end the year this year with your final effort to make a Five Great Circles map. It's going to be lovely. It'll be colored in at the end, labeled well. We use all caps for maps, all capital letters for maps all caps for maps. And uh, we start the process all the time by getting uh, those five great circles written down with a certain system the students have learned throughout this year, folding the paper, the directions are on these slides if you need them. Um, our, the Arctic Circle, Tropic of Cancer, Equator, Tropic of Capricorn, and Antarctic Circle are our five great circles. And after we do that, we draw, we get to the place where we can just draw basic circles that represent all seven continents um, throughout uh, you know the world and this is something most of the students can now do without looking at any directions whatsoever they can just take a blank white piece of paper and draw these seven different continents next we uh, started shaping them a little bit better and as you can tell on this screen we have the basic um, of north america south america europe asia Australia, Antarctica, and Africa. And this year we focused on shaping Africa. So that was our focus for the year. We don't shape every continent every year, um, but as you get older, you'll carry with you the knowledge of the years before. And so in the years before, people have learned how to shape Asia and Australia, Europe, South America, North America. And over the course of time, you will get to the place where you can be anywhere with a blank piece of paper or a chalkboard and just draw and label all the continents and oceans in the world, which creates a lot of international awareness, and we're really grateful for that um, lesson. So that's a new assignment. Go ahead and focus on that one. Then we every month we have some terms of uh, geography that we try to focus on. Um, this month we focused on, we introduced it before spring break in the middle of going into quarantine. So um, we talked about plateaus and buttes and mesas, and as you can tell here, a plateau uh, is flat on top, but it is largest. A mesa is medium size and a butte is small. Um, and here we have a quiz. If you'd like to pause the video and go through and figure out how, um, which one is which, what would A, B, and C be? And then the next slide, I have the answers. So pausing is helpful. And here are the answers. Of course, A is a butte. B is the big plateau, and C is the mesa. Hmm. The terms starting week 24 that we're going to talk about are water table, aquifer, and groundwater. These are kind of three connected terms because they all have to do with making sure we have water to drink, right? Um, and it starts with the water in the clouds that could be rain or snow or hail. And when that comes down to the earth and it seeps into the holes through the dirt, um, it goes down into the ground and becomes groundwater. The water becomes groundwater 
And the place where it stays is called the aquifer. And the level of the, the change in the, the level of water is called the water table. So uh, this process continues. And the reason we're talking about it is that the Roman Empire took over this entire area. And one of the things that this Mediterranean Sea area, and one of the things that they ended up doing <coughs> was settling this land over here called the Levant or the Holy Lands or Israel um, or Palestine. It's the land of many different peoples. And uh, at the time, Rome learned how to put water, make water accessible. And they did a fantastic job with wells and aqueducts and things like that. So um, let me just explain a little bit with this picture. The Romans would build a well. Um, it, looked, it didn't look exactly like this, but that we'll say this is their well. And during the month of January, if you see down here at the bottom, we have the months. Uh, the month of January, there's a lot of rain. And so the rain would fill up and the water table would be higher. But then eventually the weather would change and the summer would come and June would be here, July, August, September, October. And those months didn't have a lot of rain. So it would uh, lessen the water table, lower the water table. And inside this area, the dirt is called the aquifer and the water is called groundwater, but the actual level changes. And so that's called a water table. Well, now you can see this well here and the um, Roman people, if they had had a well, they would have this problem also, but we have this problem even today in 2020. Um, this well ended up you know, drying up. It was empty because the, the water had been used for plants or people and had lowered the water table. Then the months would come and change again and the rains would come through January, February, March, April. <clears throat> they would raise the water table and then it would fall again. Well, over a long time, you can look at this red line here on the graph. Over a long time, that, uh, you know, water table would lower year after year after year and create a bigger problem. And so that's why when people say don't waste water, you want to make sure and keep the water table from year to year as high as you can. And that long term depletion is, is definitely something that they struggled with back then and we struggle with today. So that's a little bit about our geography terms. Here's some more information if you want to read it instead of hear me talk about it. Now, welcome to week 24, Humanities, Art, Music, and Timeline Date. Um, this is our focus for the month uh, for music appreciation. We're, we're working on Handel's uh, uh, Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah. Uh, this is an amazing um, choral piece that George Frederick Handel wrote back in 1741. He was born in Germany, but he spent his career in London, England. And uh, he wrote this piece, um, and we are using it because at the end of this month, our timeline date is going to be for, you know, 3 BCE, um, Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, Judea. And that hugely rocked the world as far as um, changing the face of the planet with Christianity, um, becoming one of the primary relig religions after that. And this piece follows the biblical account of God's promises as spoken by the prophets, and it ends with Christ's glorification in heaven. They tried to make that feeling um, come out through the way they did the chorus. And you can watch it here on this optional resource. You can watch it performed. Um, it's just a huge production. It takes very many people um, to make it happen. And it's very, it's still performed today. 2000. It, it will be, probably continue to be performed for many years to come. And you can push on this little button and it will let you hear the piece. Um, but you can also look it up in your Google Drive um, on uh, under Hallelujah Chorus. Um, so the, our art appreciation for the month is the Pantheon. We are studying Rome and this is in Rome today. You can go to Google Earth and find type in the Pantheon and it will bring you here and you can look at it. And you can go to Street View and see it like these people right here in the front. There's a little van and some people standing here. That is great because it shows us perspective. And imagine standing there and how gigantic this this uh, 
amazing temple um, was, is today. And it was built back in 126 AD. So it's nearly 2000 years old and still standing strong with many beautiful details. There's so many details we would love to tell you about, but this smart history resource right here is a great video. Um, we would depend on smart history quite a bit to tell us uh, awesome things. And um, they go through this temple um, to the gods of Rome uh, very nicely. It was built by Marcus Agrippa Domitian and Hadrian. Hadrian, if you know, he built a wall also up in Britain and he was quite the architect engineer. So it was just a huge feat. Um, if you can imagine standing back here at the base um, all the way to the top of the dome, um, which there's a huge dome back here, is 43 meters or 142 feet tall. And if we just for round estimates say that your ceiling is 10 feet tall, that is 14 stories tall they were able to build. And that was quite a, quite a feat uh, of engineering. So very cool. Uh, for our timeline date today, this week, um, we are talking about 221 BCE, Qin Dynasty began constructing Great Wall along nor China's northern border. And this is also something that is just unbelievable, another engineering feat that they um, accomplished. And there are two fantastic resources here I'd love for you to watch. One of them is just on the Great Wall, but then the other one is a piano concert you can watch um, of the piano guys at the Great Wall. So that's really fantastic. Uh, and let me explain it to you a bit. Here we have a great view of the Great Wall of China. Uh, it travels throughout the mountains um, for I think 10,000 miles, and we are only seeing a small portion of it here. This is a, a portion of the wall that tourists and photographers love to come to. It was built on the very tippy top peak of the mountains, and it continues um, as far as the eye can see, basically, through these mountains. And you can see it way back here. It's just huge. Um, <clears throat> this section was built in the 15th, 16th century. So this is like 1,500 years after it had begun in 221 BCE. So really continued um, to grow throughout China. Um, here's another great picture. You can tell how steep it is. If you do want to ever go visit it, um, it's just bring your tennis shoes, lots of walking. Also, you can look at this on Google Earth also. It's just a fantastic um uh, thing to look at. It's one of the very few man-made things on earth that you can see all the way from space. Uh, just a huge accomplishment. So if you remember that the Zhou dynasty ruled China the longest, but then eventually the Shang and Zhou dynasties fell. And this became a period of time called the Warring States. And at the end of that time, the Qin dynasty gained power. And they uh, accomplished the huge task of defeating the other six kingdoms and uniting China. And as a part of uniting China, they wanted to uh, install, you know, the Qin ruler wanted to install himself as the emperor, which was the Huangdi instead of a king. And uh, emperor meaning there's kind of a divine power that comes from, uh, you know, supernatural source that makes you God. Um, on earth. And so he called himself the uh, Qin Shi Huangdi. And that uh, title uh, became uh, very meaningful to the people there. Um, he didn't rule very long, only 15 years, but that's much longer than our presidents, uh, you know, stay in power. So it was still got him enough time to make a really lasting impact even to today. Um, here we have uh, just a picture of what it might have been like to construct the, the Great Wall. Um, they didn't have the machines we have now, so they did everything with just tons of people power, and uh, they put tons of people on it. They also accomplished a lot with funeral uh, rites, and I will talk about that more in a little bit. <clears throat> so here's a couple of discussion questions. Uh, why do people build walls? Um, why would that happen? We've seen it happen this year in our studies in Troy, in Jerusalem, in Babylon. 
walls were something that they used. So uh, you can pause and discuss that. Why would people groups build walls? How important were those walls for them? Uh, you have another picture here of what it might have been like to construct it. Uh, just the organization. I think you should notice the snow on the ground back here. And the emperor or the leaders have these beautiful robes on to stay warm. But then you have all of these people who um, are probably enslaved and aren't fed well, aren't taken care of super well. And they are building this, this feat of engineering. Um, the Great Wall took many generations. Not a single dynasty finished it. It just continued to go, um, be, you know, to be worked on for many years. Um, I'll show you a, a map here in a second. After I want to, before I before I show you another map, I want to show you this. This is, a, as you can tell, an outline in red of the United States. It is the kind of a picture is if you put the size of the United States on top of China, this is what you would see. Um, they're about the same size, right? China and, and the USA are about the same size. So then if you go to the right here, you can see this great wall and how, you know, just gigantic this great wall was. Uh, and it, it was uh, basically, uh, if you take the chance, you can you look at this blue line on the left and see <laughs> if we were to put the Great Wall of China on top of the United States, this is how far across the United States it would stretch. And I don't know about you, but this takes about three days to drive. It's a very long, um, you know, a wall. So with it being so huge, uh, they they had to build it in different dynasties. Um, and if you notice, the yellow wall started it. it. It started at the beginning down here with the yellow, and that's the Qin Dynasty's efforts. But then they tried to keep moving north so they could kind of take over more land. And you can see the efforts they made up north uh, to continue moving and enforcing control. And that idea of enforcing control was the purpose of the wall. They linked the ramparts or the walls together, and then they destroyed other sections. So um, you can go today and see that. It's a very fascinating accomplishment. It was written about in their ancient texts. Uh, one historical text called the Shi Ji um, named the Great Wall um, the first time. Um, let's read it together. You can start reading with me in yellow. Ready? Begin. After Qin had unified the world, a host of 300,000 built a great wall, constructing its defiles and passes according to the configuration of the terrain or the mountains. It started at Lintau, crossed to the Yellow River, wound northwards, touching Mount Yang, and extended to Laodong reaching a distance of more than 10,000 miles. And so that is a, a huge accomplishment. We, uh, you know, have not done that here in the United States, of course. So I think it's really worth your time to check out um, the extra resources on that. Here's a map kind of letting you see a general idea of the, the biggest parts of the wall. Um, and from space, you can see something like this where you can see parts of the wall uh, you know, taking over the north of the country. Mm. So in the, the effort to invent ways of engineering to make this work, they invented a system called rammed earth. <clears throat> if we pretend that the yellow earth down here at the bottom is uh, loose dirt, they would put loose dirt in a, um, in uh, in this column, and then they would press it down and ram the earth. And they would put more loose dirt on top of that and ram that down until they had layer, 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 layer of rammed earth. And that is how they constructed the walls throughout the country. Um, the Shiji uh, historical book says that Chin utilized the natural mountain barriers to establish the border defenses scooping out the valleys and constructing ramparts, which were big walls. Ramparts are, are walls you can walk on top of. So um, dynasties later did the same thing. And here's a good discussion question. You can pause and discuss um, why build a wall on the peaks of a mountain range? 
what are the positives? What are the negatives of that? As you can tell here, there's just um, be very hard to get to, to bring the dirt and uh, all the supplies up to build these amazing um, stretches of the Great Wall. Um, so what are the positives and negatives of building at the peak top of the ridge? Um, as we move on, there's this fantastic a, a feat of engineering that I want to point out. They also, um, for the Qin uh, dynasty, uh, invented something called canals, or they used canals. My laser pointer is going to follow along a river. Rivers, of course, are man-made. I mean, are, are naturally made. They are not man-made. And the river here is easy to travel on because, not that one. The river here is easy to travel on because if you have, you know, farm animals or food or soldiers to move around, it's much easier to do that on water. And then over here, there's another river. And what the Chin people figured out is that it would be easier to dig a man-made canal between the two rivers and worry about the different heights of the land and how to make the water obey you. Um, and moving, making that canal system worked for them and they continue to make little canals and big canals throughout the whole country. So canals were a huge engineering feat. Also, they had a funeral, um, things that they did. This is called Terracotta Army. You can Google this, and um, but you can also look at this awesome National Geographic four-minute little film on the Terracotta Army. They were a people, uh, uh, they were um, clay structures, terracotta structures made after people. They're bigger than actual people. All of their faces look different. They're, they have different uniforms on representing different parts of China. Um, as you can tell, this uh, in the top right of the picture, there's people here visiting this um, terracotta army, and they're small. And that's just kind of gives you the scale of how gigantic this area is. They have covered it with a huge covering um, over the top of the entire archaeological find, and it was not found too long ago. It's, it's something you could still go work on today um, if you wanted to do archaeology work. So a uh, really fantastic um, Qin Dynasty accomplishment there. Welcome to week 24, Humanities. We're going to talk about the recitation. This month, we're working on Mark Antony's funeral oration, as I already recited. And one of the things I'm going to point out to you is all these places where um, they use the word honorable and ambitious. Uh, in this speech, we have this picture of Mark Antony. He's a, a, an artist's version of this story. And he's standing here giving a speech in front of a crowd of rowdy, probably violent uh, people who are very upset. Um, here's Julius Caesar, who's been stabbed and who is lying there dead. And Mark Antony is trying to uh, speak at the funeral because he was the friend of Caesar. And he has been told that he is not allowed to say anything bad about the conspirators. Now, this is Shakespeare's uh, interpretation of the whole situation. Of course, we do have a lot of writing about it, so you can see the play or you can see real history. But either way, we have Mark Antony here giving a speech using a device of speaking called rhetorical irony. So this is a speech you get to actually use maybe air quotes while you speak it. When you're saying, I'm going to read from the top, here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. As you can tell, using the air quotes, I was trying to point out that um, that Mark Antony did not believe that Brut Caesar was trying to take the crown. He did not believe that Brutus was actually being honorable. And so he used those words to convince the crowd in a kind of a sneaky way. And that is called um, rhetorical irony up here. And um, that's kind of the theme of the Julius Caesar play. It's kind of a fun one to recite as students because you get to uh, 
um, talk about something in a little sassy way a little bit. Um, up here, there's a, a play, I'm sorry, two YouTubes to point out. The first one is on the actual play, Julius Caesar. And the second one is on the uh, a TED educational video on Caesar, Julius Caesar himself. So uh, we have another artist depiction here, Mark Antony, the dying or the dead Julius Caesar and all the crowd um, that he's speaking to. Another picture here, Mark Antony, Julius Caesar, very famous speech. So I think you'll appreciate this one. Welcome to week 24, Humanities, Rome, the Empire. We are going through Rome all of this last term, but the theme this week is the actual empire. Uh, we start off uh, just reminding you that you're welcome to take Cornell notes. I know many of you will not, but it's because uh, it's quarantine and it's optional for sure. But just so you know, that is something we're going to resume in the fall. Cornell notes are something we really value um, teaching students how to uh, do good note taking. So to start off with our first topic today is Spartacus. He is a person who had been enslaved. Um, and he had, uh, you know, these handcuffs on him. You can actually see his feet also. They have chains on them. And he decided, I don't want to be a slave anymore. And he helped start a gladiator and a slave revolt. Um, 78 gladiators uh, started off um, revolting, including their leader, and they escaped and started a rebellion. And this happened during the Third Servile War. They were being forced to do things they, they did not want to do. They did not want to die. And he became kind of a hero. Um, soon they had over 120,000 escaped slaves. Uh, that's a lot of people. There's no texting or messaging people back then. And they figured out how to communicate and get 120,000 other slaves to escape with him. They started down here at the red dot and they were um, going up. They had a skirmish here. They did pretty well at that, but then the Roman army sent in a lot of troops to squash the rebellion. And here in uh, the number two area, they had their final battle. Um, we don't know exactly where this stuff was happening, but you can still find archaeology today on this, ar archaeological um, artifacts. And uh, when th they ended up ending the whole battle, Spartacus was defeated. He did die. They um, they never found his bottle, body. Um, and I just want to point out that they didn't have weapons. They didn't have the, the, the awesome you know, uh, armor that the Roman soldiers had. So they went and used kitchen utensils, which of course were much more dangerous than these, um, kitchen utensils to get in to where the weapons were stored. And then they got weapons and armor for themselves and they fought in that way. Uh, the Romans ended up capturing the slaves and, uh, and they terribly, uh, put them uh, in crucified, uh, they crucified them on this road called the Appian Way. It is said they had 6,000 crucifix uh, people being crucified down this entire road. And if you wanted to use the road, which most people did want to use the road, you had to walk between the dead and the dying um, people uh, who had been enslaved. Uh, the, the big deal here is that, yes, the, the slaves died and it was terrible, but it did speak out about human rights and should we have slaves. <clears throat> it did start people thinking about the rights of the slaves and it didn't have a, a huge effect at the time, but it, it is obviously someone we're still talking about today. So Spartacus was a hero. Our next topic is the Roman army. Many Roman armies... Um, in, uh, many armies in the past have not been really well supported by their government, but the Roman army was. Um, the Roman Empire valued its army. They sent out the army to squash any rebellions that happened, and uh, so they were the backbone of the Roman Empire. They were well trained, well equipped, well organized, and they had those awesome Roman roads to uh, to travel down um, to move quickly around the empire. So you can pause and discuss 
um, what would it mean to have Roman roads um, it, around the empire that, that this army could travel around quickly on? Well, one thing is that, um, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the soldiers before I answer that question. The soldiers were two different types. The first type were citizens. Um, these uh, soldiers had to sign up for 20 years. There was not like a four-year soldier, uh, you know, time period. You had to go for 20 years. And if you lived at the end of 20 years, you were awarded good amount of land and money. And once again, you were a citizen. So citizens got a lot of rights in Rome. But the second kind were, were the auxiliaries. And auxiliaries, auxilia being the Latin word for helper, um, they were uh, helper soldiers. They were not citizens. And when because they were not citizens, they had to sign up for 25 years, which is uh, quite a bit. And if you lived, then you could be awarded at the end of that citizenship to Rome, which was hugely valuable at the time. And you uh, got to have lots of privileges because of that, like land and, um, and voting rights and things. <clears throat> and at the time, you could just say, I'm a Roman citizen and get a lot of rights. So um, I just want to ask you, you know, the question that, that we try to tie in here is something to do with the United States. And in the United States, immigration and people from other countries coming to our country is a huge topic talking about citizenship and how to get it and who should have it. Um, and in the United States, you have a lot of privileges when you are a citizen. So um, in the United States, we say that humans are born with privileges. In fact, in our Declaration of Independence, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this just kind of goes to show that our uh, value is not based on citizenship, ideally, but we do have to distinguish between citizens and non-citizens. So the controversy in the United States and even back in Rome was what, what do you do there? What do you do to, to um, deal with the differences between citizens and non-citizens? Okay, um, here are some Latin terms talking about the Roman armor. As I told you, there have been so many cool inventions back um, in history, and they invented better armor. It was very strong. They had iron um, plates that were strips, but then they kind of copied what a, a caterpillar or a roly-poly bug would have, and they made the strips flexible by just making um, strips of them. And the iron made it strong, but because it was iron, it was very, very heavy. You had to be in very good shape to carry it around. And they, uh, all this, all this armor was provided by the Roman government. So um, I'm sure not all the time was it perfectly provided, but nearly all the time it was a huge deal. Um, you can read all the Latin words: tunica, tunic, um, and balteos is belt. So um, go ahead and have fun looking at that. Our last topic is the are the Roman emperors. Rome had many, many emperors. They went through them very quickly sometimes. Uh, and I'll show you a list of them. Look up here. There are 40 plus, 50, I don't know how many emperors here. Look, this. there's this one year in AD 69. There were four different emperors that year. So they knew how to go through their emperors. Um, quite a few um, people and so what I'm going to do today is just talk to you about the best and the worst of the emperors. So we start off with Caesar Augustus, the first one. Um, and here, this thing is called a bust. It's a sculpture made out of marble. And uh, someone has carved the marble rock to make this bust. Um, he ruled during Pax Romana. You probably have heard his name in biblical literature. Um, it, he was referred to, it says... Um, that in those days, Caesar Augustus called for a census. Um, and so that uh, idea of, uh, you know, taking a census to find out how many people lived in Rome was something that he instituted um, or copied and did. Claudius um, was another great emperor. He started this the conquest of Britain, um, built awesome roads and canals. 
um, brought people all the way up through Europe and into Britain. Um, and the aqueducts and the roads and canals were very important back then um, to bring water to people, um, transportation to people, travel. Trajan is another armor, uh, another emperor considered the greatest, um, ruled for 19 years, and he was considered the greatest because he increased the wealth of the empire and size of the empire. Uh, and Marcus Aurelius um, is our last one that we're going to name in the good emperor um, batch. He was called the philosopher king. Um, he was known as a stoic philosopher, which means he wanted to be chill and not have extremes, uh, no extreme lows, no extreme highs in life. He wanted to keep things um, very calm, and, uh, and ha he thought that would help the people the most. Um, so here are some pictures of them. Here's Claudius and Trajan. And the thing that made them good emperors was not necessarily that they always did r the right choice, you know, that was kind or good, but that, that they helped the people. Their main goal was, even though they were emperors, was to help people. Um, then we have Diocletian here. He split, the, split Rome into two sections, an Eastern Roman Empire and a Western Roman Empire. This really helped the empire because it became even more strong. Um, but he did persecute and kill many people. Anybody who was basically different um, at the time, Christians uh, were uh, getting killed quite often um, because of their religion. So we saw people um, treated badly because of their religion, which is something we try not to do here in the United States at all. Um, and then we have a, a couple of terrible emperors uh, to discuss to end today. Um, Nero, one of the worst, he is uh, somebody who's known for enjoying watching other people have pain. And that was not, um, he's not written in history very nicely about, uh, <laughs> not written about very nicely. He actually is said to have played the fiddle while Rome was burning, while people were screaming and dying. He just sat there and played music. Um, he is the alleged killer of Jewish apostles, um, Paul and Peter. And, uh, and that they were actually um, Paul and Peter who were the apostles of the new religion, Christianity. And, uh, oh, there it is. I fixed that. And we have Caligula. Caligula is an evil person, <laughs> was a very evil person. He only reigned for four years, but he just pronounced innocent people, um, you know, that needed to be assassinated. And uh he assassinated people. He was assassinated by people of his own bodyguard. Um, he was accused of killing others just for his amusement to watch them suffer. Not an awesome guy. And our last one is Domitian. Domitian is somebody who kind of typifies what is not great for the people. Um, he got rid of the Senate and he overthrew the senators. And uh, when he did that, it just was a big statement that he wasn't going to listen to the people anymore. And he made himself a divine monarch, which means he believed that he could rule as a king, but that his rule was was sanctioned by God. And he had rights from, from heaven to be the leader. He um, was still following the Roman gods, and he built an expansive palace and just took lots of uh, money and power for himself and didn't necessarily help the people, which is why he gets to be in with the bad emperors. So as we end today, make sure you check out your home linked assignments and see what's written there for assignments, but also see all the fun links that we've put in. And there's just so many cool things to look at um, and learn about history. We'll do our best while we're in quarantine. Enjoy.